that kind of begs the question then. Um, not all pen tests are created equally. Not all pen testers are created equally. So Kyle, oh, I, got, yeah, I, I got this one for you, bud. Uh, what separates a good pen test and a good pen tester from maybe one that's not so great? Well, first off, I want to mention Dylan's talking about exploiting that vulnerability from 2008, the MS 08067 he mentioned. And I think I just exploited that earlier this week. So that's one great thing a pen test can reveal is, you know, something from 12 years ago can still be super relevant uh, today. So that was a good call out. But uh, as far as what actually separates a, a good test from a bad test, you know, I think the primary thing you're going to get out of a good penetration test is is something that it result that meets your expectation as the client. And that that's kind of a vague, you know, definition, I'd say. But honestly, you can work with 10 different uh, organizations and do 10 different penetration tests and very likely have 10, you know, slightly different uh, results that they're looking for. And, uh, you know, a very common goal that penetration tests usually go for is just to acquire what we call domain administrator rights, which is, you know, basically a position where you can access and have control over the majority of the machines within a network. And that's, uh, you know, a good goal to get to. And it's something that a lot of people like to, you know, get in a network, get those privileges and kind of wipe their hands of it, shift the report and, and then say they're done. But, you know, some of the examples of actual goals that we see with our clients, you know, are things like um, they might have some new firewalls in their environment and they're looking for us to test the segmentation between those firewalls. So, you know, maybe can the people from the finance department, can their, uh, you know, their credentials and their computers access things in maybe the, you know, healthcare segment of their business. So uh, things like checking segments are, we're asked to do occasionally. Um, a lot of times our, our customers want to see if we can find any a PHI or PII, uh, personal health information or other, you know, personal identifiable information. And basically that's sensitive information that, that our customers hold um, about their customers. So they want to see what can really be revealed in that realm uh, if an attacker were to get in their organization. Um, and other times, like, like Dylan mentioned too, you know, my, we might just be asked to do a web application assessment to uh, see if their custom developed web application has any flaws. So those are just some, you know, goals or examples of goals that we see with our customers. And a lot of those things are determined by the maturity of that uh, organization and their security posture inside that organization. So, you know, we might work with a small client that has a pretty immature program, maybe only a couple people on their security team and, uh, you know, just some simple tools that they've implemented. And we can go in there and, and help them, uh, you know, get some of those initial procedures going maybe for their instant response team based on the penetration test and, and evaluate some of those tools. Um, and other times we might be working with, you know, a large fortune 100 organization, say that has hundreds of people on their security team and a very robust environment inside. Um, and they're going to have very different goals than, than that organization. I organization, I just mentioned that was a bit smaller. Um, also when I think of, you know, good versus bad penetration tests, a, a big thing that comes to mind is the interpretation of just, you know, generic vulnerability scan results versus an actual in-depth penetration test. Um, it's unfortunately still pretty common in the industry for folks to come in, do a you know, penetration test where they just run a vulnerability scan, um, look at some of the results, kind of spit them out into a report, uh, pretty them up a little bit and hand them off to the client. And, and that isn't really a super um, great valuable, or valuable uh, value proposition for the customer. Um, in comparison, a, you know, a good penetration test is going to use uh, you know manual analysis and critical thinking skills to really investigate vulnerabilities maybe some from an actual automated scan but a lot of them are going to be things that we find that scans cannot easily detect um, so you're looking at you know manual evaluation versus kind of uh, you know minimal due diligence and uh, you know as part of that you know good penetration test as well you know a good penetration tester should be able to utilize current um, you know attacks and techniques that are out there in the wild that are really being used and then also, you know, maybe after the penetration test is over, um, this is something Synercom does in, in a form of what we call an adversary simulation. We can actually, you know, sit down with you after the test is over and run some of those attacks back in real time. And, and the defenders can be, you know, sitting at their tools, looking at their consoles and their logs and uh, trying to see what those attacks actually look like on their network. And, uh, you know, having the ability to run those attacks back with you having someone that's skilled enough to do that helps you tune your tools so that you're really um, ready when a real attack occurs. So really, I'd say overall, all that said, 
um, a good penetration test should result in actionable results that uh, are validating your security posture. So there's a lot. That's, I mean, there's, there's clearly a lot there, but you said something that I think is really interesting. And you mentioned that often the scope of the test is dependent on the maturity of the organization. And that's interesting. And I think Kirk, uh, given, you know, your extensive history here, I think you're probably the right person to ask this. What indicates that an organization is mature, that it's ready to be doing these pen tests in the first place and that they're actually able to even action these things. You're muted, my man. I don't know how I got, you can hear me? Yep. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. We got, come on, I got on mute. Um, the risk assessment process, I think, is huge. That if you're going to do this, if you're going to be mature enough, you need to understand the risk. You need to understand, you know, where's your business headed? You need to understand and be able to communicate that up the ladder to like the board, as well as technically where the rubber meets the road. So the risk assessment really, allows you to understand what's your attack surface, what are your important assets, and then what's important then is making sure in the past a lot of these attacks that have happened is people went out and invested in, in tools, best of breed tools that are effective, but a lot of times they get put in and then they really don't get tested or configured. So they're unfortunately, you get a false sense of security that you've invested in a lot of these platforms, but you've never really tested them either individually or as a system to validate they can actually detect activity in your network and remediate that activity. So that the maturity model starts with risk to the business. That's why this is all there. We're also seeing the trend that you know more and more we're seeing from point in time testing. How do you leverage that point in time testing, like penetration testing we're talking about today, in the com continuous validation? And the other thing you need to do is no one has unlimited budget. So how do you how do you free up resources to do this and you have to leverage uh, the maturity of the tools that come out uh, as they now can support some of your new technologies. Uh, also um, validating by actually doing testing and then doing exercises to prove that you can actually solve and identify and solve risk or know that you can't uh, so that you can do something else to counter, counter that risk. So that's, that's really big. Uh, we've talked, you know, like a little plug out, you know, to, to Juniper, a great example is uh, I was just watching, they just had their virtual summit and they were talking about applying and clouds use tags instead of IP addresses because in the old world, IP addresses on your premise were fine, but when you get into cloud, those IP addresses are changing all the time. So how do you apply a common policy everywhere? Well, you apply policy based on the tag and that tag can be applied on your premise or in the cloud or anywhere so that policy gets can be applied universally as opposed to having to understand well now I'm in the cloud I got to do this versus on premise versus somewhere else so you got to watch new technology and be able to leverage that as well as automate those tasks that can be automated so that you can focus on what's important to your business